Hi everybody, I'm Bill Cloud and I want to thank you for joining me today. We are going to be discussing the Torah portion called Devrim, which means words in the plural. And this is the opening portion of the book that is also called Devrim or Deuteronomy. And so it goes from chapter one, verse one over to Devrim or Deuteronomy chapter three, verse 22. And so, as I've already kind of mentioned here, the name of this Torah portion takes its name from the book that it's contained in. In fact, the official name for the book that we call Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called Ele HaDevrim, which means these are the words. But it gets shortened over time to just Devrim or words. In ancient times, this particular book was called Mishne Torah, which kind of means loosely a second Torah or a second telling because it's commonly uh, viewed as being a repetition or maybe a review of the Torah. It, initially, God is speaking to Moses and Moses is relating the things that God says to the people. But in the book of Deuteronomy, as the people are preparing to enter into the land, Moses is now recounting all the things that God has said. He's reviewing them. He's going back over them again. Uh, to tell the people a second time. In uh, this particular case, he's more specifically telling the children and the grandchildren of those people who first came out of Egypt because most of those people by this time are dead. Now, the Greek-speaking Jews uh, translated this particular phrase as deuteronomion. I hope I said that correctly, as second law. So it's just kind of reiterating what we've already said. But now let's go ahead and read from the Torah portion in Deuteronomy chapter one, verse one. These are the words, Eli HaDevrim. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness. Again, Moses has been leading the people all these 40 years and now he brings them to the, board, the borders of Canaan. And in three different addresses, he's going to recount for them all the different things that have happened over the last 40 years. As he does this, he's also preparing to die. He's not going to cross over the Jordan, meaning that once the people cross over into the Jordan, they're no longer going to have access to Moses. They're no longer going to have that reminder of God's constant presence with them throughout their ordeal in the wilderness. And so, as one of the last acts in leading the people, he's going to warn them about the different temptations that they're going to encounter once they cross over the Jordan River and come in contact with the people in Canaan and all their different practices and their gods and all of their uh, debauchery, all the things that you're gonna see, that you're gonna hear, that's going to try to lure you into its clutches. Before you go over there, I'm gonna remind you of what God has told us, what God has said to do, not to do, the things that he's delivered us from, the how he's provided for us. It's kind of reminiscent of a parent who has been uh, kind of teaching their children kind of in an isolated scenario. Maybe they're, you know, homeschoolers. And they've been teaching them all the things that are right and holy and just and virtuous, but now they're getting ready to go to college and they're going to leave home and they're going to be exposed to all that life has to display. And so the parent is reminding the child, okay, remember what I've told you. Remember what you've been taught. Remember what you know, because you're gonna be exposed to all kinds of things that are gonna disagree and they're gonna tempt you. That's what Moses is doing. He's warning them because once they cross over, he's no longer there. They're going to need faith and they're going to need to employ discipline, spiritual discipline, in order to avoid the snares that are gonna be placed there by their neighbors, the Canaanites. And so this was the purpose of reviewing the Torah before he passed away. Now, a very uh, well-known sage of Israel, referred to as the Vilna Gaon, wrote this. The first four books were heard directly from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed is he, through the throat of Moses. Not so Deuteronomy. 
Israel heard the words of the book of the uh, Israel heard the words of the book the same way they heard the words of the prophets who came after Moses. In other words, Moses told the people himself, this is what I've heard God say, this is what I've learned, and this is what I'm telling you. And after Moses passes away, that's the only way, according to the Vilna Gon, that the people are going to hear the words. It's going to be like when the prophets would come and speak to them. And I believe this is a very important point because by and large, that's how God's people today hear the words, devrim. It's not a Mount Sinai experience. It's not God from the top of the mountain in, enveloped in a thick, dark cloud and lightnings and flashes and sounds and shofars and all those things. No. It's through the mouth of other people. It's, it's by reading it and it's by you know, studying it. That's, that's how we learn these things. And so it's a different experience. When Moses was walking the earth, on multiple occasions throughout the first four books, it would say, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Or he would say, and the Lord spoke to me. But now it's, he's, he's, I'm telling you this. This is what the Lord spoke to me, and now I'm telling you this. Before the Lord said to Moses, speak unto the children of Israel and say, all right, so my point is, that's how we hear today, from the mouth of another. Not necessarily, I hope you understand what I mean by this, directly from God, even though it's His Word. Nonetheless, we hear His Word through the mouth of another. We're not at the foot of the mountain anymore. It's not this dramatic sight. It's just day in, day out, routine life. And still, these are the words. They haven't lost their importance. They haven't waned in truth. They are still God's ways that he expects his people to live according to. Now, if we were at the foot of the mountain, boy, you would think that we would take it to heart a lot more than we do today, generally speaking. But considering that the people who were at the foot of the mountain, none of them but two crossed over into the land, I dare say that it wouldn't be any different today. And part of the reason is, I believe, that people typically go around looking for signs and wonders. They go around looking for the drama. They go looking for the Mount Sinai experience. But God wants us to hear his words through the mouth of another. He wants us to hear his words the way that Israel was going to hear them after Moses had passed. There was a reason for Mount Sinai. It was dramatic. It was fearful. It was fascinating to consider what it must have been like. But it served its purpose then. But now God is speaking through you and through me and through others, his witnesses. That's how God wants people to hear his words. Because, again, if he always operates in the supernatural, uh, not supernatural, but the dramatic and the, you know, the very uh, demonstrative way, well, people have a tendency to go looking for those things. And according to the Messiah in Matthew chapter 16, those who go seeking after a sign are called a wicked and adulterous generation. In other words, they're not really looking for God. They're not really seeking God's will and His way. They're just seeking a sign. And once that uh, sign has dissipated or once that excitement has gone, they'll go looking for another sign. And they'll always be looking for signs. They'll always be looking for wonders. But they'll never stop to hear the words. There's a lot of people who feel like there, there has to be something to grab their attention, like the Sinai Revelation. And people, generally speaking, are less likely to respond to the Word when they're just facing the routine, day in, day out, ordinarily li ordinary life. So, in Deuteronomy, Moses is expressing to the people his understanding of what God has spoken because that's going to kind of set a precedent for what's going to happen for generations uh, hereafter. People are going to hear, they're going to read, they're going to study, and then they're going to teach 
others. This is what I understand God has spoken to us. And consequently, Judaism refers to Moses, Moshe, as Rebenu, our teacher. Now, the words that Moses spoke to Israel were, as we see, in the wilderness, that is, beyond the Jordan, not in the land, but as they prepared to enter the land. And I find it's very interesting that no part of the Torah was written in the land, but it was written outside of the land. But the Torah was a way of living once you were in the land. In fact, living this way in the land was, was uh, in part to serve the purpose of being an example to those who were not in the land. But it's just kind of interesting that the Torah was written beyond the Jordan, outside of the land. And maybe in part that is also to emphasize the fact that this people that came out of Egypt were largely disobedient. In other words, two years after they had come out of Egypt, they were poised to enter into the land when they were at Kadesh Barnea. But that's when the spies went in and the 10 spies came back with the evil report and the people gave into it and they listened to the evil report and they became fearful and they became doubtful. God brought us out here to die and because that's how they responded to the evil report, they were forced to wander another 38 years and consequently, most of the Torah was written outside of the land. It's just shining a light on the unbelief and the unwillingness of God's people to, to do what they were supposed to do. Now, the word wilderness is midbar, and it's spelled mem dalit bet resh. But what is very interesting about that is those same four letters can be pronounced midaber, and midaber means to speak. The point, God often uses the environment of the midbar, the wilderness, in order to midaber, to speak to his people. Why does he do that? Why does he speak to his people beyond the Jordan? Why does he speak to his people and give them his words in the wilderness? Maybe it's because in the wilderness, he has their attention. They don't have the conveniences that they were accustomed to, even in Egyptian bondage, where they had the free fish and the melons and the leeks and the cucumbers, all these different things. In the wilderness, it's just them and God. He has their attention, and so he speaks to them in that kind of an environment. And this is where Moses uttered these words, that those words that were spoken that we need to hear. Because you see, it's not often that we get to sit at the foot of Mount Sinai and hear God speak in an audible voice. In fact, that's never happened to me. So how do we hear? Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I need to hear the word of God. I need to hear it spoken by others. I need to read it myself. I need to hear people give their understanding of what God is saying. I need to hear what this person is hearing from God and people need to hear what I'm. Uh, hearing from God. And when we, we come together and we're hearing this, if we're being guided by the Spirit and staying within the boundaries of Scripture, this is, how we, this is how we form sound doctrine. And that's how it's propagated. We hear the words and faith is built. And then that faith is, is multiplied and it's propagated when others hear the Word of God. A problem that we often run into is that people will hear, or let me say they will listen to the words, but don't really hear the message within the words. Think about it. How many times did Yeshua say, he that hath an eye, let him see? Not once. But compare that to how many times he said, he that has an ear, let him hear. Well, what was he saying? He was implying that you might be listening to my words right now, but you're not hearing the words that are within the words. You're not hearing the message within the message. And so in order to hear the words, we've got to have spiritual ears. We have to be inclined to, to really understand and, and, and 
embrace the Word of God as we hear it. If we're distracted by the cares of life, we'll listen, but we're not really going to hear. The thing that brings faith is not going to come by just, you know, having these two appendages on the side of our heads. It's got to be that the sound waves go beyond this and penetrate our heart. That's how we hear. And so again, Messiah didn't say, if you have eyes to see, see. No, he said, if you have ears to hear, then you hear. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 13, he says this, I speak to them in parables, that is to the people, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, nor do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart has become gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and they have closed their eyes, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and be converted, and that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. In other words, to boil it down, what he was saying, I'm speaking to all these people in parables. I'm speaking to them in dark sayings. By the way, that, that term from Psalm 78, uh, dark sayings, is a word that means puzzle. I'm going to speak to them in puzzles. It comes from a root word that means to tie a knot. I'm going to speak to them this way because really what we need to find out is who's really seeking God, who's really wanting to hear the message, and who's just listening to the word. So I'm going to give them something to listen to, but let's see how many of them are actually hearing what I'm saying. So that's why he said he spoke to them in parables because once again, you have to have ears to hear what he's saying. But Isaiah's prophecy makes it very clear that Israel's heart was dull toward God. Then and in, uh, in, the, in the days of Messiah and in the days of Moses, their hearts were dull toward God and so they didn't really hear his message in the words that he said. What did he say to them? Possess the land. Moses encouraged them, be strong and of good courage. The Lord your God goes before you. He'll fight the battle for you. Don't be afraid of these people. Don't be afraid of the fortified cities. They listened to the words, but did they hear the message? And the answer, because their heart was dull toward God, they did not, and they did not possess the land, even though it was a land flowing with milk and honey. And by the way, the 10 spies who gave the evil report confirmed that it was a good land and that it was flowing with milk and honey. But all they could see, all they could really perceive, not what God was presenting to them, but the giants, the fortified cities. And they, they, they listened to Moses, but they didn't hear the, Mos the message that Moses was presenting to them. And so, as it turns out, instead of just traveling 11 days <clears throat> from Horeb to Canaan, at, and that Kadesh Barnea entering into the land after only two years in the wilderness, because they didn't hear the message, they spent another 38 years wandering around the wilderness until they got the message. And so as the people are preparing to enter the land 38 years later, <clears throat> Moses reiterates what God has instructed Israel to do and how they are to live. That Moses speaks these words just prior to his death, I believe, adds emphasis to his words. I mean, this is the, one of the last things he's going to do on behalf of the people. These people that he's speaking to, some of them, they never knew Egypt. They've only heard about Egypt. All they've known is the wilderness and Moses leading us through the wilderness. And so as he's preparing to die, this is the last thing he's going to do. So again, I believe that adds extra emphasis to what he was saying. And I would like to think that that made a deep impact on those people who heard him say these things. It would have a, a heavy influence on those people who were listening to the words of this man that we've known all of our life and who is soon to leave us even as we are preparing to cross over into this land that we've heard about, but we've never actually been there. 
Now, there are commentators who consider this explaining the law on behalf of Moses to mean that not only is Moses going to reiterate to them the things that they've already heard, the things that God has already said, but also to unveil to them the, the hidden meaning in the Torah. In other words, so that they could hear God, not just listen to God, not just listening to Moses tell them what God says, but that they could hear God for themselves. And I think that's an important thing to consider because we don't have a Moses today. We have the Messiah, we have what was recorded, and we have his spirit to teach us and to lead us into all truth. But at the end of the day, I've got to hear God for myself. You've got to hear God for yourself. Yeah, we can hear others preach and teach and, and share and encourage, but we've, we've got to hear God for ourselves and not just listen to the words. So Moses, by doing this, was encouraging them to listen with more than just their ears, but to listen with their heart so that they would avoid a similar circumstance that the people ran into 38 years earlier, and that is because those people weren't hearing with their heart, only their ears. They turned their hearts to the evil report of the spies. That's what they heard. That's what they gave into. And so he's, he's wanting them to hear God speak to them through his words with their heart, not just their ears. So in doing so, if they can hear God from themselves, they're not going to retreat from the giants or the fortified cities like their fathers did. Because, I mean, think of it this way. If when they left Egypt, if God had not taken them to Mount Sinai, but taken them directly into the land of Canaan, they were going to have to fight giants and scale fortified cities. He didn't do that. He brought them to Mount Sinai first because he knew they wouldn't have fought. They would have returned to Egypt. So he brings them to Mount Sinai. He appears before them. He speaks audibly. They hear his voice. And in part, that is to encourage them and to place confidence in him that he's going to lead them into the land. But when they heard the spies report, they didn't want to fight the giants. They didn't want to have to deal with the fortified cities. 38 years later, as the people are preparing to go into the land, the giants are still there. The fortified cities are still there. And the people who cross over the Jordan are going to have to contend with that. And so Moses says, in a matter of speaking, don't just hear with your ears. Hear with your heart. Don't retreat in fear as the previous generation has done. He was encouraging them to live out these things they, that they had been taught. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 8, he says this, The Lord our God spoke to us in the Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the land of the Canaanites. I skipped over a little bit there. To go to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. So in these verses, what we see is, Hey, you'd spent, a, you'd spent long enough at Mount Sinai. You've been at the foot of the mountain. You've gone around the mountain, but that's long enough. You've been here long enough. You've been listening to instruction long enough. You've been hearing teaching long enough. Now the time has come. Go out and walk it out. Put it into practice. And I, I wanted to bring this out because I believe that that's where we're at now. Specifically speaking to those who consider themselves to be part of this Hebrew roots awakening, messianic, whatever you want to call it. We've been talking about the Torah. We've been talking about what uh, was given at Mount Sinai, about the feast, the Sabbath, this, that, and the other. We've heard teaching after teaching after teaching after teaching. I believe that the message that we need to take to heart today is that we've been at this mountain long enough. We've heard the words. We've heard the teachings. But there comes a time we have to walk it out. And that's what Moses was telling them to do. Go walk it out. Go possess the land and live it now. 
it's time for us to do the same thing. It's time for the Hebrew Roots Movement to possess the land, so to speak. Years ago, I, I gave a message that um, kind of become known as the flash, flashlight message. And basically it was this, that a flashlight is only good if you turn it on. But even turning it on might not be enough. You have to direct it at your path in order to see how to walk. And so what I uh, liken that to is the flashlight is knowledge. Turning it on is understanding of that knowledge. Pointing it at your path is wisdom. And so knowledge in and of itself is not enough. S sitting at the foot of Mount Sinai and garnering all this teaching in and of itself is not enough. We have to understand why God has given us this knowledge, why he's imparted this information to us. And then we're going to have to have wisdom that comes from on high in order to know how to walk these things out before our friends, our neighbors, our enemies, and the world because we're called to be a light to the nations. And so we focused on things for a long time. Now the time has come to, to focus on how to live these things before our fellow man. So I think that if I, if I could kind of summarize everything this way, it would be, here are the words. In the days ahead, in this last day, People will be less impressed with our knowledge of Hebrew and the temple and this, that, and the other, and more impressed with how their lives are positively impacted by our lives and how we live it and how we're walking out these words that we've, we've been studying. In, in other words, in Matthew 11, the Messiah, let me read uh, verse 5. It says, in response to these emissaries that have come from John the Baptist, are you the one or should we look for another? Messiah says, you go back and tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You go back and you tell him that, and then he'll know that I'm the one. Not that more people are learning Hebrew, more people are wearing tzitzit, more people are keeping the Sabbath. That wasn't the response. You go tell John that he'll know that I'm the one because people's lives are being impacted for the better. That's what I mean when I say it is time for us to go and to possess the land, to walk these things out. We've heard the words, now we need to go live the words before people so that their lives are changed. And frankly, if we haven't learned that message, then we really haven't listened to his words. And so we need to quit just listening with our ears and start hearing the words with our heart. And with that, we'll say shalom.